The words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my salvation. Amen. I apologize to you for the com confusion a few minutes ago. When I got my bulletin from Pastor, it didn't have that hymn in it. And so therefore I didn't have it out, and it didn't have it in my book, and I didn't know where I was or what I was doing. And my wife would say, well, that's normal. <laughs> Winners become losers. All three of our lessons have that kind of theme in them. Jeremiah had been preaching and preaching and preaching what God had told him to do. And he was preaching about that Judah, Judea, and Jerusalem and Israel would have their comeuppance for not obeying God's word. And he preached this and he preached it for a long time, but nothing happened. And so therefore the people were really riling him and they were teasing him and making all kinds of things that would make life difficult for him. And finally he got to the point where he said to God, where are you? What am I doing here? And God didn't care for that very much. And he said, when you repent and when you start speaking words again, as I've given you, then I will build you up like a bronze wall and all the things that people are saying to you and doing to you will be meaningless. And so Jeremiah went on and kept preaching. God does things in his own time and in his own way. And Jeremiah learned this maybe the hard way because as long as he was preaching and doing what God told him, things were going all right for him. Not really well, but they were going all right. But soon as he started getting upset because God wasn't doing things right away, God decided that, Jeremiah, you've got to repent. And turn around and start preaching again because I am with you always to the end. And so Jeremiah did turn around and he became Again, a winner in God's sight. And this is what we're looking for. We want to become winners in God's sight. Paul said in our epistle lesson for today that we need to react in a, a loving way to all the members of our community, even the ones that we may not like personally. But no matter what happens, we are to show the love of God to all the people in our community, not just the ones that we like really well. And this is something that's really difficult for us because if we don't like somebody, we usually let them know, don't we? And God is telling us through the, through the epistle lesson for today that, hey, if somebody is mean to you, don't be mean back to them. Show them kindness. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. And that'll be like heaping coals of fire on their heads. Very difficult to do. Very difficult. But the more we love God, the more we're able to show love to those that are not lovable. This is a difficult thing, as we all agree. In our gospel lesson for today, there's a different story. Up to this time, Jesus had been healing people and doing his ministry, preaching and going out and being with the people. But now things are turning around, and for the rest of the gospel, through the end of the book, he is going to be telling about his suffering and death. And when he mentioned this, Peter just had all kinds of negative reaction. He used to, it, the Bible uses the word Peter rebuked him for saying these things. And rebuke is a thing that's only acceptable for God to do, 
as far as the, the Bible is concerned. God rebukes the sea when Jesus was in the boat. He rebuked the sea. God does the rebuking. He changes bad into good for the people that love Christ, for you and I. He turns, he rebukes the, anything that's against us. He rebukes the devil when he tries to lead us away from him. But the rebuking is something that's only in God's purview, not ours, and definitely not Peter's. And Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. In other words, he really was letting Peter know that what he was talking about was not really acceptable. But why did Peter come up with this? Why did Peter say, no, this won't happen to you? Why did Peter say, no, this can't possibly be pro happening? Because all through the Old Testament, if you read it, you'll never hear, read anything about the Messiah suffering and dying. There are indications of it in the Old Testament, but there's never anything that specifically says that the Messiah will come to suffer and die and take away our sins. This is something new as far as Peter is concerned, and he had to learn it now the hard way. You and I are fortunate. We know that. We're at the other end of it, and so we know what Christ has done, that he suffered and died taking away all of our sins to the cross. But then he rose again on the third day and ascended into heaven. And we have now this hope of living eternally with God in heaven because this is what God has promised. We know that what Christ has said is true. What God says is true. And we have no problem with it at all. But Peter had a great deal of problem with it because he had never heard this before. As far as he was concerned, the Messiah was going to come, and a lot of most of the people in that day believed that the Messiah would come and they he would gather the people together and they would get rid of the Romans and they'd be back to the old days like they were under the days of Solomon. That they would be a nation that would be reckoned, reckoned with and that they would be firmly behind loving God and being God's children. He couldn't possibly come and die. What purpose would he pro prove then? And Jesus said to them that many, most of them, before they died, they would see the risen Christ. And they did. Remember, before he ascended into heaven, the disciples went up on the mountain with him, and they saw him rise into heaven. And they heard the heavenly Father say, This is my beloved Son, whom I love. Listen to him. So he, they got the final message that said, God loves each one of us. God wants us all to know the wonderful love that he has for each one of us, that he gave his own son to suffer and die and take away our sins so that we would have eternal life with him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But it goes on farther. It says, God so Lord did not, oh gosh, now I'm having one of my moments. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We are all on the saving end of that grace of God. God sent his son that we might be saved, that we might have the joy of anticipating eternal life with him. And I have to say that the older I get, the more I anticipate this. And the more less I anticipate getting up in the morning and limping around and 
wondering, well, okay, what's today going to bring? I'm looking forward to that day when I can smile when I, all the time in God's presence. That's all right, Barbara. Don't worry about it. Do it. <laughs> I had one of those days yesterday. God loves us, and we want to never forget that. God loves each one of us so much. And he's always by our side so that when the devil seems to tempt us to go and do our own thing, which is the prevalent thing in this society today, that he's there to take our hand and lead us back to that path, that straight path that leads to heaven. We forget a lot of times when things are going wrong, we say, God, why are you doing this to me? What happened? Why aren't you with me? And we should be saying, have I deserted you? What do I need to get back on that path again? Many times we like to say that God has deserted us. I can't say that I say it every morning when I get up and creaking out of bed, but there are times when I wonder, why does God let this all happen? But he said to us, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. He's there by our side to help us through all the difficulties that come in this life. And we have lots of them, I have to admit. We all have lots of them. We have our health issues. We have all kinds of issues. Sometimes I can remember when earlier in my life I had difficulties as far as money was concerned. They have all kinds of concerns. But the thing is to remember that God is with us always by our side to help us through all the difficulties that life brings and that we bring upon ourselves many times. Because I can say that in the early days when I had money problems, they were, my con they were my fault. I didn't handle money like I should have. But God led me out of that and got me back on my feet again. We need to remember that no matter what's going on in our lives, God is there. He's there to help us, to guide us, to direct us, to hold us up, lest we kick our foot against the stone. God is always there. God loves each one of us. As I told the children, he loves each one of us equally. He doesn't want any of us to fail, to come to live with him eternally. And so that is our goal as Christians, to remember that God is with us and that we are to be as a, in a community where we serve each other, where we help each other when we know that there's a need, where we're kind to each other, where we're always there ready when something happens. God loves us, and we are to love each other as well as he loves us. And like I said, sometimes this is very difficult, very difficult. But that is our goal in life. That is our commission from God, to love each other as he has loved us. A difficult thing to do, but as we go through our week and then we go through our months and years, remember this. No matter what's going on in our lives, God loves us and he wants us to love each other and that he is always with us to hold us up and to guide us to that final day when we will be with him in paradise. Love each other. Amen. <laughs>